Yes, we do. They have been very patiently waiting, and I appreciate that. We have Carol O'Meara and Tamla Blunt as our speakers tonight, and they are going to do a program on Halloween plant folklore. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Carol and to Tamla to take over. Great, Catherine. So hi, everybody. Um, am I going to be allowed to share my screen so they can see these wonderful slides? Yes, I have, I have made both you and Tamla co-hosts, and so you should be able to share your screen without any problems. Sounds great. Awesome. Can everybody see that OK? Yep. And Perfect. hear me all right? Yes, we can. Well, happy almost Halloween, everybody. I'm Carol O'Meara, and I'm with the Boulder County, Colorado Extension Office. And with me is- And I'm Tamla Blunt, and I'm at- <laughs> Go ahead, Tam. We're, we're not Sorry. that practiced on Zoom. <laughs> I know. Uh, I'm Tom LeBlanc at Colorado State University. So I'm based in Fort Collins. So we're going to have a little bit of fun tonight. And we're going to be taking a look at um, plants. You know, plants have been um, a part of folklore, whether it has to do with Halloween or not, throughout human history. And what's really fascinating... Where's my volume? I'm sorry. You can't hear me? Oh. No, I can hear you. I think somebody else had their um, microphone on. They have it muted and they were talking. I don't know. Okay, well, I'm just gonna go ahead and keep going. Um, plants, as mentioned in folklore, has to do with far more than just Halloween tales and things that are spooky, but because of the month, we've decided to take a look at some of the plants that have been associated with things um, such as a witch's brew. It's even made it into uh, major literature like Shakespeare's Macbeth. If you take a look at what the witches were chanting with the eye of newt and toe of frog, wool of bat and tongue of dog, adder's fork and blind worm's sting, lizard's leg and owlet's wing, you know, for a charm of powerful trouble, like a hell broth, boil and bubble. This was a pretty cool thing for Shakespeare to add into his, um, his uh, Macbeth play. But here's the thing, and historically speaking, witches or crones used to make a living uh, in part by uh, bartering for or selling charms and um, potions and ointments and that sort of thing. And so it stands to reason that one theory that's out there for such fantastical names for the things that went into these potions were things that no person could possibly keep in their pantry. I mean, frankly, how often do any of you decide that, well, you've just about had it with that neighbor's dog barking, so you're just going to go ahead and go to the cupboard and grab a little eye of newt and toe of frog and do away with that particular barking animal. None of us do that. But in reality, what they're saying is that witches were trying to protect their craft by coming up with fantastical names for everyday items. So let's take a look at what was in that particular um, potion that those witches in Macbeth were putting together. Eye of Newt is actually mustard seed, toe of frog, buttercup, wool of bat, holly leaves, Tongue of dog, well, it makes sense. It's hound's tongue. Adder's fork is adder's tongue. And a blind worm actually is a tiny snake. And um, they believe it was one of the types that was uh, particularly venomous. But if you take a look at this, it's actually kind of cool because these are a lot of things that maybe we do have lying around. So go ahead when that person in traffic that's always cutting you off or perhaps you'd like to go ahead and come up with a love charm for somebody take a look in your kitchen because in the many cases uh, things that we have just lying around we might want to mix it up and put it into a nice dip or something and uh, perhaps we could come up with sorrel vanilla cinnamon and coriander and put it together in order to win love or 
basil, dill, cinnamon, ginger, and spearmint if we want to earn a little more money. You know, a, a kitchen for a witch means so many things beyond food. But it wasn't easy to be a witch, and um, it actually wasn't easy to be a tomato either. And if any of you have met me, and I see a couple familiar faces out there, you'll know that I'm a tomato aficionado. I really have a passion for the tomato, and its history is um, just steeped in a lot of interesting facts. But here's a plant that started out as a lowly weed. It was a weed in um, the Andes, and it was indigenous people that uh, took this plant whose berries were no larger than currants, and throughout um, South and Central America, the indigenous people cultivated it and the fruit was growing larger and larger and larger. So when explorers brought the tomato back into Europe, it caused quite a sensation. Part of the problem was Europe was undergoing a, uh, a real craze at the time. Well, actually 300 years of being afraid of witches is more than a craze or a fad. They actually went through a long time where they were frightened of witches and the powers that they didn't understand. But unfortunately in 1550, that's when the tomato was introduced into Europe. And they were terrified of this. During this time frame, you know, when they were frightened of witches, uh, there were a lot of people that were really dedicated to um, hunting them down. And in fact, it was a job. And the witch hunters were looking for several things. And one thing in particular that consumed them was trying to figure out what the mysterious ointment was that they believed witches would put together to accomplish two things. One was how um, it, it would give them the ability for flight. So whatever unguent that that witch would come up with to smear on herself or her broomstick would allow her to levitate and then give her the power of propulsion so she could fly. The other thing that the tomato was credited with, or um, pardon me, the ointment that was credited with was turning witches or somebody else that they didn't like into a werewolf. So the tomato was associated with witches and werewolves. And it's interesting that if you go into some of the writings like witch hunter Henry Boger claimed that witches liked being becoming werewolves because they would stalk through this kind of a dying landscape like you see around Halloween and for whatever reason inexplicably attack small children but only on the left side. You know, their, their fear was really pretty specific. So let's break it down a little bit. Why was the tomato then believed to be one of the key ingredients? Well, it wasn't in particular, but the, the uh, witch hunters, including the Pope's own physician, Andre Laguna, agreed that the components that would allow both um, turning into a werewolf or being able to fly was made from hemlock, henbane, mandrake, and nightshade. And it is the tomato's bad luck that they are botanically related to mandrake and nightshade. So much so that the fruit of those plants look like tomatoes and the nightshade plant itself, and that does grow wild here. So maybe you've seen it in your landscapes. I know we see it down here. It is virtually identical to tomato plants. So, you know, this, this confusion just went in to this whole folklore that the tomato was um, the tool of a witch. And, oops, sorry, it, um, it got a really bad rap in so far as being able to turn unsuspecting people into werewolves if witches wanted this. So strongly held was this particular folklore that it gave rise to the Latin name associated with tomato, which is like Opersican. In other words, the wolf peach. So the tomato has had a really rough time, but we know it to be delicious. Oops, sorry, sorry, sorry. There you go, Tamla. I need to unmute myself. Okay. So wolf's bane, 
is also a, an herb with um, toxic properties. And it is, of course, related to werewolves as well. Historically, if um, the people who use this, they dip their arrows in the poison that was extracted from the plant, and uh, they use that to hunt wolves. So that gave rise to, of course, the word wolfsbane. Next. Oh, next, please. That was the next one. Oops, sorry. There it is. Oh, oh, there it is. <laughs> sorry. Okay. So they're actually quite a beautiful flower. They are a member of the buttercup family, um, but <laughs> they're extremely toxic. Uh, these plants are also known as European monkshood or aconite. And if you have these in um, any type of pasture area, uh, it can cause incredible harm to the animals. And so uh, pets and children and livestock should definitely not eat this particular plant. Um, and even touching the plant actually can cause reactions. So uh, the whole of, of this being a, a poison for werewolves is more than actually just a myth. It actually is a real poison. And so that's, you know, one of those things that can be really toxic. And um, in folklore, uh, wolfsbane was actually used as a werewolf repellent. Next, please. And it... Um, was supposedly protecting people from uh, the big bad wolf. Um, but it can even make a werewolf run away though or die, uh, supposedly just by smelling it or eating it. And so uh, they used to hang, people used to hang bundles of these plants over their door or near their livestock pens to keep the wolves and werewolves away because um, they, supposedly the wolves would eat this and then die instead of um, eating there, or the smell would deter them instead of eating the livestock. Next, please. So Sorry. from Sorry. werewolves, we move on to... There it is. Oh, you're okay. So from uh, werewolves, we'll move on to witches again, or we'll move back to witches again. We'll talk about the Salem witch hunt and, and the legendary... Um, witch hunts that happened back in the uh, late 1600s. So um, basically what scientists have discovered now is that the witch hunts of Salem, the, what, what the behavior of the people um, that were supposedly witches, it was actually caused by ergotism. And this is um, caused by the fungus uh, claviceps purpurea. This is ergot. And what this fungus does is it invades the, the developing flower heads and it actually takes the place of uh, the grain, uh, the kernel of the grain. And if you don't catch it, you can actually grind that ergot up into the, the grain and people were doing that and making bread with it. They were grinding it up into flour and making bread. And so rye is one of those, it was a um, Wheat was generally reserved for nobles, if you will. Um, rye was for the peasants. And so consequently, um, a lot of the people that were being affected were, of course, working, working poor back in the 1600s. And so they would grow the rye um, and, and then it would get infected. They wouldn't catch it. They wouldn't see it. And then they would grind it up and it would end up in their food. And so the ergot actually produces a chemical. It produces lysergic acid, which actually is LSD. And so that can cause some serious problems. Next. So in the winter um, of 1692, there were uh, Reverend Samuel Paris. Um, he noticed that there was a couple of young girls in his home and they started acting really strangely. Um, they had contorted postures. They... Um, ridiculous foolish speeches they were throwing items and all of this is because of the lysergic acid reaction the reaction to lysergic acid from ergot and so what had happened was they the girls probably had eaten some bread that was contaminated so again you know but because at that time people didn't know that ergotism was the cause they just thought oh my goodness all these these girls are just being super crazy and what was happening so Next, please. 
So um, they couldn't figure anything out. And so ultimately they just decided, well, it's witchcraft. And these people were, uh, these women were possessed. And generally it was women. I honestly don't know if any of uh, if there were any men that were ever accused of being witches. And personally, I think that's a little bit sexist, but you know, the women were acting strangely. And so they, they, they um, decided that um, it was that they were witches. And so they wouldn't have anything to do with them. They would, uh, threw them in jail and there were over 200 people that were accused and ultimately 20 were executed and uh others died in jail because they just they weren't getting care and they just um you know if they were eating still eating the the bread that was contaminated with ergot then that was a huge problem and and they would continue to decline because of the reaction to that lysergic acid so it was, you know, it's one of those things where now we, we look at it and we say, oh, well, there's not any, you know, we don't have witches or things like that. So, uh, but back then, you know, nobody, there was no science and nobody knew what was happening. So next, please. So St. Anthony's fire is another um, uh, description of ergotism because the, um, um, St. Anthony was actually uh, born in like 250 to 356, and he decided that he was going to withdraw from life and live a life of absolute solitude. And during the course of his retreat, he actually went to Egypt and he began his uh, legendary combat with the devil, if you will. And he supposedly withstood a series of temptations from the devil and um he the devil would come to him in many forms and he would beat the devil back and you know he was uh the early monks who followed uh saint anthony or anthony at that time he wasn't a saint yet uh they considered themselves the the vanguard of god's army and so they attempted to attain that same state of spiritual purity and you know, they, they, what they saw was that Anthony was, Anthony was actually, you know, he endured a lot of these attacks and, and his visions were so exotic and it was so steadfast. And, you know, Anthony emerged as the sane and sensible father of Christian monasticism after all of this. He came back and so the rule that bears his name, uh, St. Anthony's rule, um, it came, you know, um, it was compiled from writings and discourses um, that it were attributed to him. Um, eventually, his popularity um, grew and he became a saint in the Middle Age. But what happened was St. Anthony's fire is also uh, another term for ergotism. And the, um, the order of uh, hosp hospitallers of St. Anthony was founded in France and this institution became known for housing people with ergotism and that's because um, people felt like they were being burned at the stake or their fingers and toes and feet were dropping off and things like that and those were the same symptoms that anthony was uh experiencing when he was fighting the devil out in uh in the desert in egypt so that's what happened with those well you know saint anthony's fire has been around for a really long time next please and back in uh, August of 1951, this was, you know, not so many years ago, they had another outbreak of ergotism, uh, St. Anthony's Fire. All of these people, there was about a, a village of about 4,000 inhabitants, and uh, there was like one in 20 that the inhabitants went mad. And so what happened was uh they had all of these hallucinations they were uh you know they were vomiting they had those tingling sensations in their feet and eventually it was discovered that it was again poisoning from ergot in the rye bread that was the cause and there was a local baker that was being very unscrupulous and he was trying to cut corners basically and he purchased infected grain and he was making uh bread with all of these things so it was not a really good thing but one of the things that um, they discovered was when the, back in the 1100s, when people who were affected with ergotism went into that hospital, 
that hospital that was named after St. Anthony, they tended to get better. But that's because they were being fed wheat bread. And so they started getting better. But when they went back out into life after they felt well enough to leave the hospital, then they started eating rye bread again and they became re re well not kind of reinfected they were affected again by the ergotism so it was really you know it was kind of a cycle and they were trying to figure out they didn't really know it was the wheat that was the making the people better because they weren't eating the ergot but it was it was interesting that they were seeing these things happen a lot so that's say that saint anthony's fire and the salem witch trials next please and back to you carol Oh, this is one of my favorite topics, and that has to do with the jack-o'-lanterns because of the infamous Stingy Jack. We all know that we love to carve pumpkins at this time of the year, and originally, you know, a lot of folks would do um, these carvings, and they would set them around their house to frighten away evil spirits. Um, the Irish brought this to the United States when uh, they were immigrating here. Um, a nice, just one of those fun facts, just a little tip for you, wait to carve your pumpkin until, um, you know, Halloween so that it lasts longer. And then if you want to, you can kind of make yours really memorable by sprinkling cinnamon and nutmeg on the inside top of the pumpkin and the heat from the flame will give your um, jack-o'-lantern a really nice pumpkin pie smell for when those uh, trick-or-treaters are coming by but that just hides a really dark past. Let's talk about Stingy Jack for a moment. He was an Irishman and he was not a nice guy. He was a drunkard, he got in a lot of fights. He was generally um, reviled by the people that knew him. And one day the uh, devil did come to try to collect his soul and he tricked him into turning into a coin and then he put the devil in his pocket and he wouldn't let the devil free until the devil agreed not to try and collect his soul for 10 years. So Jack set him free. But 10 years later, the devil came by and Jack cornered him up a tree. It's hard to understand how that could be possible, but the story goes, Stingy Jack was so mean, he cornered the devil up a tree and wouldn't let him down until the devil agreed for the second time that he would not collect his soul. And for that, it was forever. The devil went away and he was really angry, but Stingy Jack lived out his life. And when he died, he found he'd created a real pickle for himself. Because you see, heaven didn't want Stingy Jack and now neither did the devil. So he was condemned to roam the earth forever. And when he complained to the devil, when he said, you know, it's dark out here, where was he supposed to go? Because the devil was so angry at having been tricked twice by the same guy, he hurled one of the coals from hell at him and told him to use that to light his way as he wandered the earth. So at the time, many of the Celtic people and people of the British Isles would carve um, beets and turnips and the like, as I mentioned, to set around their homes in order to scare away spirits. So Stingy Jack took that coal and he hollowed one of these out and he put it inside his turnip and he carried it around. And forever after he was known as Jack of the Lantern or Jack-o-Lantern. So the Irish brought this myth with them when they came to the North Americas. And here we have other plants, other fruits that do just as well, maybe even better than say a beet or a turnip. We have these beautiful pumpkins. And so this is how we got our jack-o'-lanterns today is from that tradition and those stories that came out of the Irish and the story of Stingy Jack. So let's turn to a little more villainous sort of um, foe, and that has to do with vampires. It's well known that to defend yourself against vampires, you need a couple of things. You need a crucifix, maybe some holy water, certainly a wooden stake, and garlic. Hanging garlic around your doors or windows, you know, if you want to hang it around your neck, Garlic has always been given the credit of being able to repel vampires, but why? I mean, 
is it bad breath? Is it that, you know, we, we eat garlic and we sweat it out our pores and we don't smell good? What is it? Well, here's the thing. There are a couple of different stories out there as to why the myth of vampires rose. And yes, there is one associated with Vlad the Impaler, but that has no association with garlic. But there are two medical reasons out there why we might have the myth of vampires. So the first one has to do with uh, the correlation of it with rabies. Now, Dr. Juan Gomez Alonso made some connection to the area where the myth of the vampire arose, and that was in and around the Balkan region. And he traced it back specifically to an outbreak of rabies. Well, around that time anyway, from 1721 to 1728, there was you know, rabies running rampant. And as we know, if you've ever watched the movie or read the book, Old Yeller, you will certainly know what I'm referring to when you know that an animal infected by rabies is going to be snarly and slabbering and baring their teeth and try to bite you. And this doctor found in his studies that a quarter or 25% of the men who have rabies, who are rabid, have a tendency to bite other people. And so it is in this that one theory where the root of vampirism is um, believed to, to have arisen. Now, the other one is that there are a series of blood disorders, several diseases, but collectively porphyria. And this is a physical condition where the body doesn't produce heme, uh, a component of blood. And this has some side effects for the afflicted human. So a light sensitivity, um, disfigurement, uh, erosion of the lips and gums. And so, you know, you get these people that shun the light and they have this horrifying um, appearance because, you know, their teeth are bared and they dislike sunlight. Okay, so we have these two theories. Perhaps this is vampirism, perhaps that's vampirism. But we still haven't discussed why garlic. Okay, well, let's take a look at it. Rabies-infected people or animals are hypersensitive to any kind of strong odor, any olfactory stimulation. So it is possible that if it, the, the myth came out of people that were infected by rabies, the pungent smell of garlic is something that repelled them or drove them mad. Now, those who suffer from porphyria have an intolerance to food with high sulfur content and garlic is one of those. So it is entirely possible that we might be seeing a myth about vampirism based on something that might have been a medical condition or an ongoing medical condition, and it just grew into some kind of a myth with the very real possibility that garlic is in fact something that people that are afflicted with this can't take. So that's garlic. I'll turn this back over to Tam <laughs> for her vampire so, rants. <laughs> so we've talked about vampires and the two theories of vampires, but you know, mammals aren't the only ones to fear the dark because plants have vampires too. And these vampiric plants tend to suck the life out of the regular plants. And so let's talk about a few of those. Next, please. So the first one we have is dodder. And I'm sure that many of you have seen dodder. This is, you know, one of those things that's found in, in it can be in gardens, it can be in fields, it can be in pastures, you know, it's, it can be on vegetables, most anything it can be. And it's bright yellow. And the stems are leafless, but they produce these little structures that actually penetrate the plant that they're encircling. And those little structures tend to suck the life out of the plants and they start strangling it and strangling it. And then they produce these little whirly winds that go over to the next plant and they start strangling that next plant. And so again, once they're finished, you know, and, and they don't, 
necessarily totally kill the plants that they're strangling, but they do take a lot of nutrients out of it. And so the plant is not as healthy. The, the, the desirable plant is not as healthy, but the daughter continues to live. So um, it doesn't really produce its own photosynthesis, so it has to take food from something else. And in this case, it's feeding off of a host plant. So it's kind of like a, a vampire because it has that structure, not a fang, but uh, you know another structure that goes into the plant and sucks the life out of it. So again, you know, and it can vector a virus as well. And so thereby it could transmit something into the plant that could cause the plant to die. So it's really interesting because these are definitely um, vampiric plants as well. Next, please. And then we have mistletoe. So we have two kinds of mistletoe. We have dwarf mistletoe and we have the true leafy mistletoe. Um, the dwarf mistletoe is what we see most often in the mountains uh, on our conifer trees. And these, of course, are also parasitic plants because they attach themselves to the uh, tree by sticky seeds and those seeds germinate and they produce that structure that goes into the branch of the tree and it starts pulling food out of there and then it causes the tree to have some distorted growth and it looks like witches brooming and you know over time by the time you know if this mistletoe um, such, is such a vampire and it sucks all the food out of the, out of the tree eventually the the host plant will just die and so again you know the Dwarf mistletoe can actually send its seed out, uh, can disperse it, um, eject it from the plant, from the flower, and it goes about 60 miles per hour, and it's really sticky, and it will land on other, um, other conifers, and then it will start that again. But they, you know, again, they're just kind of this slow-sucking vampire out of the tree, these mistletoes are. So again, and, you know, no cure for it, so they can, just can't do it. Next, please. Then we have uh, this really pretty plant that looks absolutely gorgeous, and we see it in the mountains and uh, all over the plains. This is, uh, it's called Indian paintbrush. And we always like how it looks, but it does have a killer streak because it's, um, it actually is uh, parasitizing the roots of its neighbor. So, it's really difficult to germinate these seeds. Um, they require, you know, it requires sacrificial, you, you have to sow other seeds with it in order to get it to germinate. And that's because it uses those other plants. Um, you know, it will parasitize the roots of those other plants and then start taking the food off of them. So again, you know, a beautiful flower, a beautiful flower, but it's definitely a ghoul. It is a vampire because it's, it is sucking the life out of those other perennials and it's, you know, uh, just uh, taking the nutrients and doing whatever it can to destroy that. So even though they're pretty, uh, if you've ever tried to plant seeds from these things, you know it's very difficult to germinate. And I have tried this one actually to grow this one and you just can't do it unless you have um, sacrificial plants for it to feed on, right? So it can parasitize them. Next. And our next one is um, pine drops. This is also a root parasite. This is a... Uh, it's really kind of pretty and very distinctive if you see it. It has, it's really a sticky plant. It, um, it, it feeds off of mycorrhizal fungi in the soil and the mycorrhizal fungi that is attached to uh, roots of our trees, the, the natural mycorrhiza. And so these actually send up these flower spikes but they are a, a root parasite. You, you can't grow these without having those roots and that mycorrhizal fungi uh, associated with it. So it has to have that in order to grow. Next, please. So here's a picture of it um, as it looks. The, the Cheyenne Indians actually used pine drops for medicinal purposes. Um, they would take uh, the, the berries and stems and then grind them and make an infusion to be taken for lung hemorrhage. They would also uh, uh, make a concoction of the stem and berries and snuff it so to prevent nosebleeds. Um, 
you could eat the stems raw or roasted, kind of like a mushroom. Um, they would also use an infusion of roots uh, to be taken for gonorrhea. But these are parasitic plants. And so again, it is really interesting, the um, ethnobotany associated with these particular uh, vampiric plants. So it's really kind of interesting to see um, to see that. And then, of course, they, they won't grow without that mycorrhizal fungi and the roots associated with that. So next, oh, apples, yay. We have apples, the apples connection to um, Halloween. Well, you know, if you've ever gone to a Halloween party and tried to bob for apples, um, there's a story behind that. So they all center, you know, their stories that can go back as far as 400 BC. And, you know, one of these has to do with fertility and immortality where the, the apple in its place in mythology um, traces back to ancient Greece and, Greeks and Romans. Um, apples were considered a, a really potent symbol of the goddess Pomona, hence palm fruits, and favored by Venus. Um, early Indo-European mythologies uh, would tell of goddesses, um, you know, like the Norse god, goddess Iden, who dispenses magical immortality apples. So kind of like the um, sleeping beauty, you know, here, eat this apple and you will have permanent, in, you know, you will be immortal or you will go to sleep, um, you know, to, she would use them to keep her fellow deities young. Really, uh, kind, really interesting. Dex, please. So the Celts believed apples and apple blossoms were food for the dead. So they buried their dead with apples and decorated with them during Syme when uh, the veil between the worlds thinned. And so Syme is the pagan celebration for Halloween. Um, well, when the Romans wanted to incorporate their beliefs into these areas that they invaded, they kind of uh, blended some of their customs with the Celts and uh, some of those traditions of, of the Celtic Syme. And so um, crab apples are native to Ireland. Um, Romans actually brought the larger fruit. So when um, the Celts were burying their dead with apples, they were using the, the smaller fruits of the crab apples. Now, bobbing for apples, if you've ever been to a Halloween party, def uh, was originally used to declare a mate to determine who your mate was going to be. So the... Um, the females would mark their apple with their initials and put it in the water trough. And then all the boys would start bobbing for apples. And whoever, you know, they, you know, you picked up an apple and then you looked at the initials on that and that was your uh, intended. That was going to be the love of your life. And there you go. You know, you could um, also, uh, you know, this was matchmaking done by apples sort of thing. So, <laughs> Next, please. But there's also mysteries associated with apples, right? Um, apples have been associated with rich, witchcraft for a long, long time because, you know, if you cut open an apple crosswise, it reveals, uh, it looks like that five-pointed star, the pentagram. And so by pressing spell ingredients into that pentagram, that pentacle, um, it would supposedly enhance love charms. And so uh, the you would, they would also use seeds in spells that would help represent um, protection of all of these. So it's really kind of interesting. I had heard this myth a long time ago and I wasn't quite sure. Uh, I was looking, trying to look this up and it was like, really, uh, because of the five pointed star, it was, um, it was uh, considered, you know, the, the witchcraft because of that pentagram shape. And if you uh, look at uh, pagan, uh, pagan literature and pagan religions, they use the pentagram uh, quite a bit uh, as their symbols. Uh, the pentagrams are very, uh, very popular in that. All right. So next. Back to you, Carol. I am working on it. You get the flower guides. Yeah. <laughs> So the last thing we wanted to talk to you about is the marigold. And uh, the marigold is something that is really, really um, 
very important in the Dia de los Muertos celebrations uh, for the Day of the Dead. And uh, it's a two-day celebration, well, actually three if you throw in um, October 31 with it. And if you, you look at this particular um, custom, this celebration, you'll find that what it is is a blending of uh, cultural beliefs into this um, several day long uh, celebration. And it's really a celebration of history and, and your family and also life. It's interesting when we look back on a couple of um, these plants that we looked at through this talk, they all kind of center on, you know, what happens around, um, you know, the, the, you know, what happens in October, you know, the witches going through the, those barren landscapes or, you know, trying to protect our livestock and this sort of thing. Um, the, the jack-o'-lanterns, which we put out at Sowen and the, the apples. It's something that I haven't been able to um, dive deep enough into um, cultural beliefs as to why universally, it seems, many, many peoples believe that that transitional time um, in the fall, which we have you know, between October and November, is when the, the veils between the worlds thin. And they thin so much that um, in these beliefs for the Dia de los Muertos, it's that um, family members can come back and visit with the living at that time. They, you know, there's a day where all souls are visiting or a day that it is for the, um, the children to be visited. So it's a combination of beliefs and the marigold is really central to this. So let's take a look at the beliefs. So it arises from three things. The um, Aztec festival, which I can't pronounce this goddess's name, but she um, was, her role was to guard the bones of the dead. And around her were sempasuchils, which are, you know, the words for marigolds, and I might be mispronouncing that, as one of the symbols. And I'll get to why in a second on that. Now, in ancient Europe, I just mentioned that there are a lot of celebrations around uh, Soen, which was, you know, the time for the thinning of the veils. And these celebrations, consisted of bonfires, but also feasting and, uh, you know, some dancing and celebrations. And then you look at uh, some of the, the settled Europe, such as um, uh, Spain, where food items were brought to the graves of their loved ones on All Souls Day when they believed the veil was thin enough that they could make these offerings to um, you know, basically uh, show their love still, or perhaps, um, you know, making sure that their, um, their ancestors that had gone before them were looked after. And they would bring panda animus, which is a spirit bread, and there were very specific ingredients in spirit bread that they would bring to the graves of their loved ones. They'd also cover these graves with flowers, like candles, and, you know, and otherwise um, help people find their way um, to the land of the living and to their own um, relatives. So the Roman Catholic Church blended these things. Um, it was a means to incorporate a lot of different cultures into the church um, for a variety of reasons, but um, they took these three different distinctly um, unique cultural um, observations into a series of days that are All Saints Day and All Souls Day. And so these are the first two days of November. And I wanna be very specific, this is not Halloween. This is not Halloween at all, but it is a, um, uh, a uh, celebration and a cultural event that is tied to the same beliefs that the veil between the world is thin then. And um, people can come back and visit with their relatives, and it's really interesting that marigolds are very central to this, <clears throat> as well as coxcombs. But the marigolds, the reason they are so central to this goes back to that goddess. And they're bright colors and they have such a strong scent. It is this that acts as a guide for these spirits when they're moving between the worlds. And so it is marigolds that are central 
to the ofrendas or the altars that are put out with you know photos of the loved ones that have passed away and foods and candles and this sort of thing in order to provide that pathway, that guide for the spirit to come back and visit. So we're gonna leave you with the marigolds for the Dia de los Muertos. And you can, at this time of the year, it's been so you know calm out as far as weather, perhaps you can still harvest a few marigolds from your own garden to have your uh, Dia de los Muertos um, celebration where you are. So thank you very much everybody for listening to us. Well, thank Carol you. and Tamla, thank you very much. That was a fun program and I learned a lot. And, you know, who knew on some of those, Good. especially the vampire aspect of things. But we appreciate your time on this. Does anyone have any questions <laughs> or thoughts on this? You can go ahead and unmute yourself and jump in and ask questions if you want. No, this is going to be a really fun way for you to have some, you know, cocktail party discussions, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. Especially <laughs> the uh, quoting Shakespeare, I have Newt thing. And, uh, well, you have to read it in your best wicked witch voice. I have Newt and two a frog. You know, that whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> Linda, I think you had a question for us. I think your hand was up. Linda? Oh no! I was I was trying to find my applause. <laughs> yeah, oh. I really enjoyed it. it yeah, miracles! I had no idea that was good. It's true, yeah. Michelle, did you have Thank a question? You. I was clapping as well. Thank you so much. Yay! So many claps. <laughs> Zoom is so weird, isn't Yay. it? Yeah, it is. There's no audience reaction other than if you're watching the video. Oh, there's one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> there yeah. yeah it is fun yeah. <laughs> well thank, thank you, you for inviting us to do this and yeah. thank you carol well, well i i want to um thank tava collins for making the suggestion of inviting you guys to be our speakers and the halloween plant lore was wonderful and uh, hi tava <laughs> i i had no idea that i of newt was Mustard seed. How cool is that? Pretty cool. Yeah. I know. I wonderful. All right. Well, learn something new every day. All right. Good night. Thank you very much. Good night, everybody. Thank Thanks. you. Have a good night. Yeah. Have a great weekend, you guys. Stay Thanks. safe. All right. Good night. All right. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye -bye. Good night.